Yeah, it's super cool. Very, you know, we say so often you're here in business, oh, we want to be data driven, right? And the irony is we're data driven, except when it comes to strategy. So the savvy PE coming in is always looking for a way to discount, right? They're going to go, hey, well, you're not worth this because of this. You're not worth this because of this. You're not worth this because of this. While the seller's going, well, I know you've, uh, for our, we are predominantly uh, US um, uh, listener base, but I know you've got a special offer, which is very kind of you to do so. Welcome back to the Raw Selection Private Equity Podcast. I'm actually delighted to bring back another Playbook Series podcast, giving you the deep dive, the value, and the actionable insights of one particular topic that you can take away and implement into your private equity firm and, of course, your portfolio companies. Now, with a playbook series, it means you're welcome back a guest. Today, it's welcome back to Carl Cox, Chief Executive of 40 Strategy. We're going to be diving straight in today to learn more about Carl. Please check out his previous podcast with Carl J. Cox. For those that listen to the end, this is rare opportunity for us, but really appreciate Carl for giving us this. We've got it. Carl's got a freebie to give away. So for our listeners that listen right to the end, you have the opportunity to have a gift posted out to your door. Let's get started. This one is an absolute cracker. Carl, we'll jump in straight with a big question. How to lead your strategy and not your business. What's your advice, please? One of the biggest challenges, right, with any organization is trying to figure out what, how you should lead, what you should do. And what we've determined is Clearly working on your business is going to create in many times a bigger multiple than it is working in your business. And so let's just pull back, right? Everyone who's listening here or is a part of private equity recognize that the most important thing that's typically looked at is EBITDA, right? Why is it EBITDA? Because then we take a multiple, which we look up, right, online with our industry and we go, oh, based on our EBITDA times a multiple, that's how we're going to actually make more money, Right in terms of the sale and the, the volume. And so most people, once again, they continue to focus on the EBITDA, but what they re don't realize is the hidden value is often on increasing the multiple. How we do that is working on the business, not just in the business. W what is an example of this? If we can help reduce the risk in different factors within our particular business, from a buyer perspective, they're going to be more willing to pay for it. So one specific example could be is perhaps in your customer concentration, you have one to two customers that are representing 80% of your business. That is a high risk. Somebody's not going to want to buy that. You're going to, have to pay a lower multiple as a result of that. Uh, another example might, and so one of your strategies of working on the business is finding new customers, right? That's going to help be a higher percentage to help reduce that concentration risk. That's a great example of working on your business. Another thing might be is yourself. If you are the CEO listening right now to this, and if your business can't run without you being there, you have a problem. You have a risk. And when somebody's coming in to buy the business, their concern is you're going to bolt right after you get your money. And if you bolt after getting your money, is that company be able to continue to perform? So one of the things you could do, and here we're talking to Alex here, who right, helps out with the recruiting, is to help bring on a team around you that can actually do the thing. So you can actually take time off, believe it or not. It's okay to take time off. That is when you know you have a great organization because you've built a senior team around you could help do the roles and responsibilities when you're not actually there. That decreases the risk, increases the multiple, and the irony actually gives you more time, makes you want to enjoy more things so you can continue to work on the business. These are some key examples. And what we're really excited about, Alex, and once again, I'm going to speak in code a little bit for those who are listening, because I just share with them, we just found a new software that, dare I say, is the holy grail for strategic planning consulting. So typically when I go into an, uh, an organization, we do an assessment and we'll, you know, often we'll come up with, hey, here's the 80 top ideas we can help fix working on your business. The reality is we can't focus on 80 things. It's one of the key things we do is we trim it down to the essential few which we typically say is what's the potential impact. We'll give some monitor score on that. And the second thing is the likelihood of percentage success. 
And from there, we'll win it, winnow it down to the select few. We implement those particular strategies to get a positive ROI. Now, the difference is that most of those things were typically what I'd say is on EBITDA. It's increasing the EBITDA. That would be the, the result. Now I have a tool that can take a look at these on the business gaps. Well, what I mean by that, they take a look at 40 different risk areas and they can then actually monetize by working on that particular strategy, how much it increases or decreases the multiple. This is so powerful. I'm calling it the holy grail for, for strategic planning consultants because if we can figure this out, we can create so much more value on both sides of the equation, frankly. For you, if you are on the selling side, if you have a business, you should be focusing on these risk areas or these strategic areas, focus on them to decrease your risk, which is going to increase your multiple and increase your exit price. And then the other side, if you're coming into a new company or you're consulting an existing company, it's going to prioritize and monetize the particular areas that you should focus on. Instead of working on the shiny object, you're actually going to do something that you can get a true ROI by working on the project. So I am super fired up, very excited about this. Matter of fact, once again, I'm not going to name this off right now, but just signed up for it. I'm going to be partnering with this organization because we see this as a great way for everybody in PE to be able to value exactly what they need to do and then actually start working on it to get it done. That's interesting. Cause I think, you know, I think even to, uh, to, to the business here at raw selection and I'm like, there's so many things we could work on. And when I say work on, on the business that improves, not in, not making those calls myself, the sales myself, et cetera, but work on, on the business. And it's like, well, what's going to move the needle the most. And, I've got no idea why we work on certain things. This might be that there's certain pain points that we've had a certain issue and that's very reactionary. But to hear that you've got some potential software, I mean, it's amazing what technology can do nowadays, isn't it? And without sounding a thousand years old, if you've got a potential software that can help fix that, then uh, and help focus the mind and focus the, the EBITDA improvements and then therefore focus the multiple improvements. That's uh, That's impressive. Yeah, it's super cool. Very, you know, we say so often you're here in business, oh, we want to be data driven, right? And the irony is we're data driven, except when it comes to strategy. <laughs> and it's it's a problem, right? It really is a true problem for us to in strategic consulting, because we know by working on the business, it creates the biggest results. But typically in my past, I can only get it by the actual results. And so we have in our case, for example, we rarely have less than a three to one return. Like meaning it, it's three to one, 10 to one, sometimes 100 to one return in terms of our work that we're working with our portfolio companies and the results they're getting at the end, whether it's with a direct measurement of EBITDA or perhaps an increase in the value of the company. We had that much confidence when we go into something, we could find that. The difference here though, is we can go the impact on the multiple, which is going to be the exit price, you know, and that is just huge, you know, to be able to go, okay, yeah, we know the EBITDA change, but we now know the multiple change that could happen. That's been, once again, kind of this black box, frankly, you know, being able to understand that because often that's argued, right? There's a massive arguments on whether the multiple should be the industry standard and what risk is there or not. And then even better than that, let's say you haven't solved it all. If you could tell your potential acquirers, we know where the three risk areas are, are the biggest risk, that's going to give the buyer so much more confidence. So they know what investments they need to make in the future to help make sure they're going to get the return on that next turn, if you may. You know, if they're going on a small to mid-size to a mid-size and to a larger PE firm and, and rolling it over, or if they're selling it to a strategic, they know exactly what they're getting as opposed to the uncertainties. You know, you think a lot of times when there is an earnout, as an example, you know, that happens with it. If you can monetize the earnout based on getting these things done, that's powerful, right? As opposed to once again, things that you can't control. As an example, you can't control if all of a sudden there's a recession in the next year. Like talk about the toughest thing in the world, right? When when somebody gets in, they get an earnout, and next thing there's a big argument in a lawsuit because a recession happened, they couldn't hit those numbers anyways, right? Even though they didn't know that was going to happen prior to going into it. But if you have things you can actually monetize and go through, it's going to decrease ideally, decrease the arguments, clarify what the multiples are, and at least know going forward what you should do. Sorry to interrupt, just a quick mention of our long-standing partnership with Grata. 
as you will probably know, the private equity scene is constantly evolving. And deal flow is moving now to proprietary and data-driven processes. Grata provides you with the data and information of over 7 million private companies. So if you're looking to improve your proprietary deal flow and improve the data access, then reach out to Grata today. Now back to the podcast. So when you've, so now, so obviously you've got the software that you're about to implement and, and uh, um, will hopefully revolutionize things for you. But when you create that list with your um, target clients and you've gone and, you know, you mentioned there's like 80 points or whatever um, of, uh, of improvement and you focused on those, you know, five, 10, three, whatever it would be, depending on the project, how much of that list is already what the client expects? So what's the chief exec, the private equity firm um, already expect and how much of that is, oh, I, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. You know, what's interesting is with when my historical process that I do, it they they typically know it, right? It's it's meaning I, my traditional EBITDA improvements that I work on with organizations, they kind of know. They know, hey, these are the things that we have to do. But we honestly don't typically focus on the risk areas. We don't focus on the multiple side. So I know that side of the view, they're going to be very surprised. They're going to be like, you mean... If I improve my accounting and legal structure and make sure that I have contracts with all my key customers, that's going to reduce the risk of my portfolio. Like that's that's a big, right? That's a big thing where often a CEO is not thinking about something like that, especially a small mid mid-size, you know, small and medium-sized company. They're just moving things along, they're getting things going. They probably don't have clean paperwork. If you really dove dove into it, do they really have contracts with all their customers? Is it signed all the specific POs? Do they have real clear vendor agreements? Typically, an organization is not going to touch that, right? That's like like the last thing you want to touch. But if you recognize that all of a sudden that was going to increase the multiple, you were going to get a two hundred thousand dollar return. You might be willing to put in fifty thousand dollars into fixing it if you knew you get a two hundred thousand dollar improvement in your outcome. So that's where I think there is going to be surprises compared to your typical expectation when somebody's coming in to hire you as a strategic consultant. Makes sense. Makes sense. So if those tools, those tools have been implemented, the investment's been, uh, uh, in been made in improving that. If I was a, a naysayer, which I'm not Carl, but I'm, I'm thinking as a private equity partner and I'm thinking, well, what defines the multiples is the market. Now I'm also going to caveat that with the basis that there is always a there's here's the higher end, here's the lower end, and that's where you're gonna you're gonna no doubt counter with it. But what for the naysayers that say the market drives the multiple, the EBITDA is what makes obviously um the main moves, which in essence is probably what most private equity firms would say, because we don't talk much about improving the multiple. In fact, you're probably one of the first people I've spoken to about it. And I speak to chief execs, CFOs, COOs, and private equity senior professionals day in, day out. What would you say as a, look, this is why the business drives the multiple in some degrees, not all just the market? Well, what's beautiful about this data is market-driven data based on the risk areas. So it is actually market-driven. So all this is pulled from data that's coming from actual transactions so based on the size of your organization and what industry. So that's the first thing. So that's what's driving the base multiple. And then that base multiple has these risk areas. And then, and then it can tell based on past of where there is, once again, gaps and risk. Going back to, once again, leadership team, customer concentration, right? These are things that you can, based on it being strong or weak, will increase or decrease the risk in that multiple factor. So these are the things where, uh, frankly, Alex, are more when there's arguing about a price of a, of a company, right? So as we all know, the, the multiple is a starting point. When you look at a company and its size, you go, okay, let's say for argument's sake, it's five. Or, or okay, we have a we have a ten million dollar EBITDA. I'm just making my numbers. Or we'll keep it simple. We have a one million dollar EBITDA, a five million dollar multiple. That that company is going to be worth five million. Well, then there's a bunch of arguments. But uh, interestingly enough, those arguments are typically based on these risk that people weren't aware of until the deal happened. Mm -hmm. 
So the savvy PE coming in is always looking for a way to discount, right? They're going to go, hey, well, you're not worth this because of this. You're not worth this because of this. You're not worth this because of this. While the seller is going, well, I see what the market is and I see what's being happening right now. And I should be getting a six multiple because there's so few companies right now that has this particular EBITDA in this industry, right? That's what happens, right? And so you have this real argument. And of course, you get a bunch of bids. And you go through the process to get to, quote unquote, the market. But once again, if we all know, everybody intuitively know who's on this podcast, if you can buy a company that has a senior leadership team in place and is not driven based on the CEO only being there, you have a lower risk company that you're going to acquire. You're going to pay more for that. People are going to bid up for that price. That's what we're talking about. And that's what this tool does. It helps monetize. It helps you understand when you decrease that risk, it's going to increase the multiple, which is going to increase ultimately the value of that, that uh, portfolio client that you want to buy or sell. Yeah, if I think of this in I'm, I'm relating this to things at the moment, and I absolutely agree with a lot of the businesses I've seen. Um, but certainly if you think of this like with the real estate, if you've got a, build, a building in the middle of New York that is empty, um, it is going to be worth less than a building in the middle of New York that's full. Then it's going to be worth that's going to be worth less um, than a business that is full with contracts and leases for ten years, um, and that's going to be worth less than full repair um, leases. Where if the building falls down, the uh, the person who's in it uh, repairs everything and fixes everything. Obviously, insurance, but um, you know that's in essence the the, the mindset that your uh, your positioning is. Uh, it just takes away that risk element and therefore increases the bullish nature, which brings more people to the party, which means that private equity firms are taking less risk when the, even if it's private equity to private equity, well, if we lose the chief exec, what's the problem? Well, if we lose the CFO, where's the problem? Well, the intrinsic nature and processes and systems are built in the business, which protect it from, from such a occurrences and, uh, and obviously eventualities. Yeah, you nailed it. It, it is, it, this is once again, it, we know this based on experience, what we're talking about. The difference here is it's putting numbers on it. It's putting an estimation based on if you decrease this risk or this risk stays high, This is there's a cost of not fixing that. And and that's huge. And, and what's so interesting is when you talk to an owner and you and you go through the conversation, they're like, oh, of course, right? But but they're not thinking about it, right? They're, you know, as you said, nobody here has been bringing up the multiple because it's like, oh, well, it's just the multiple, mm -hmm. right? But the multiple is all based on risk. It's all based on the belief, you know, like one of the surprising things, at least I expected, no different than I felt in, in the US economy when interest rates went up, right? I expected that home prices were going to fall. Well, it didn't really happen in most markets. Why? Because very few people can leave their homes because they had a lower interest rate, right? And so therefore the supply was lower, which meant that the prices stayed high, right? Mm -hmm. Same things are happening right now in PE. Many companies have been hit hard, you know, over the past couple of years after they went through and specifically talk about here in the US, right? We had a massive stimulus package that went through. We had COVID, massive stimulus package, low, high, low, right? And so people are now recovering from whether, once again, they had way too much inventory, they've gone all through that, so all the be benefits and values they had. So what has happened is, even though there's fewer good companies, the fewer good companies who have higher EBITDA are getting very good multiples, despite the weakness in the market, right? Mm -hmm. There's more PEs chasing the good companies, which is increasing the price for them, while the, while the lower, meaning if you only have, let's say, one to three million in EBITDA, you're getting less right? Because there's so few of them. And then of course, people aren't putting any money at all to those who are losing money, unless you want to go back into VC or they're getting more debt financing right now in this case. So that's very expensive. So it's a, it's a fascinating time. Once again, which once again, you expect something else to happen when, when your supply goes down, right? Because why, right? There's more risk, but people are willing to pay when there's lower risk in what's left. And that's, what's fascinating right now. Not only am I the host of the Private Equity Podcast, but I'm also the founder and managing partner of Raw Selection. Raw Selection is a private equity specialist executive search firm with two divisions, one that focuses on portfolio C-suite executive hires, and one that focuses on private equity direct hires of your back office and investment deal professionals to the industry. Alongside the podcast, 
were passionate about giving back to the industry and giving people information that they can run and utilize. One thing we do regularly every year is we run Sally reports on accurate live data of people that we've interviewed and people that have shared their information with us. So if you're looking to compare your current compensation or your compensation for your next hire in your private equity firm or portfolio company, then please check out our YouTube channel and see the playlist of salary surveys. So what's so we look at some of the examples and we focus on that multiple element. We, as I said, EBITDA is overspoken about in private equity um, and portfolio companies. But if we look at that that multiple element, um, what a and I appreciate every business is different and you've worked with lots of different organizations, um, P back, non P back, etc. But what are the some of the main things that you see that if I was a chief executive or a partner, principal? Uh, whatever at a private equity firm that I'd be wanting to say to my portfolio or say to the company that I'm running, we probably need to focus on these three areas because these typically increase the multiple um, and obviously subsequently the EBITDA, but will will give us a greater multiple. What would be some of the suggestions based on the projects that you've worked on and appreciating that every industry is different and every business is different? Well, I, I think every industry wants to sell, right? And they need to have a sense of growth. And it's remarkable how many organizations in PE that have a very, well, I'm going to be, I'm not going to be nice, terrible, terrible sales management, a complete lack of focus on it. Why? Why does it happen? Multiple reasons, but often it's because that company is a product company. The CEO and the founder loves their product. And so they put all their energy and resources into building a great, great product. And it's kind of like that concept. If you build it, they will come, mm -hmm. right? So as a result of that, they don't historically put money into a great sales management team and then a great sales management process. So a great, no matter who you are as an organization, no matter where you're selling to, but I'll, let's say for the simple, you know, let's pull it back a little bit. B2B is a little bit easier to measure this, right? And a little bit... Uh, Depends on the industry, but let's just focus on a B2B company. We want to have a strong pipeline management. We have clarity over how many leads do we have? How many, how many leads turn into opportunities? How many opportunities move into a sale? How long is that process? And what's the conversion rate at each of those steps? Most small private equity firms and even some mid-sized private you know, portfolio companies don't have that done well. So fixing that process, this is what I call on the business activity, right? Because what you're going to hear from the sales team, we're just going to increase sales. Well, fantastic, right? So they work really hard and they work through the process that are trying to get things done. But when we really gain value is when we look through the entire process, go through, we value stream map it, if you may, that sales process and understand all the different key pieces that we need to do to ultimately get to the outcome. Now, one of the things we have to be careful with is managing a hundred different metrics that aren't really adding value. So Alex, you and I talked a lot last time about that concept of leading metrics, yep. right? And so I'm going to go through another example here of what I'm trying to have every one of my clients, when I walk away from them or prospects, if you may, from my perspective, what are they thinking about? I think once again, we all can agree. If we have a strong sales pipeline and we have clear data over it and we know how to improve our sales, then you know what levers to push. The challenge is what is your most important lever or your most important leading key performance indicator? So I was with a school district a while back, and it's probably about five years ago, and I was working with them, and I was asking them, so what's your most important key performance indicator? And they said, this was a charter school district here in the United States, and, and they said, well, it's number of students, because if we don't have the right amount of students, we actually don't get paid. We need to get money to get into this because we're privately held. I said, okay, that makes sense. And so and then I, I was with the CFO, superintendent, chief strategy officer, and in this particular meeting, and, the, and I said, so what is, what, how do you track to make sure things are improving? And they said, well, we just track the number of students again. And this was the CFO answer. And being a former CFO, I understood their data look and numbers. I was like, okay, that's not helping us out. And I said, well, how do you know along the year? And they kept on saying the number of students. I said, okay, let's ask a different question. What's a different tool that you have that can measure this? And they said, that's telling you ahead of time that number of students is going to improve or decrease. And so somebody said, 
applications, number of applications. And I said, hey, that's pretty good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about applications. So we talked through it, but I asked them, do you control the number of applications that come in the door? And they were like, no. Okay, I said, well, that's probably not then one of our best leading indicators. So finally, the superintendent had this big aha moment. They went, oh, I remember what it is. I know what it is. It's campus visits. When somebody could come on to our campus, walk around with an existing student, a prospective student, coming to here, talk with, you know, they'll walk around with one of our best students. They go into a classroom, see our curriculum. They hear our great teacher. They see our great facilities. They see our athletic facilities. And then they come around the end of the building, feel the spirit of the building. And I get a chance at the very end, the superintendent, to give them a handshake, welcoming them to the opportunity to be at our school. He said, I knew for sure then whether they're going to come or not come to the school. Now, Alex, let me ask you this question. Were they tracking their campus visits? I'm going to guess not. Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. So this is the crazy thing is often the most important leading indicators not being tracked in a business. It's the one, it's the one key pivotal point in a relationship with a potential customer. In this case, this was a student, but it could be for any business, right? If you have a potential lead and an opportunity, what's the one big thing that you know you can fix. And, and we'll just go back to the campus visit just for uh, to describe it more. What could you then do based on that? Well, let's see. You can make sure, A, you have your best students walking the student around. Two, make sure they have a great welcome when they come into it. Three, make sure that it was, re oh, this was great. The superintendent at the end of it said, you know what? I haven't been doing those in a while because I've been working on my PhD. I wonder how they're going now, hmm. right? So this is like crazy. Here he, he he learned, right, that as a result of this conversation, the most important thing. You can have a follow-up after you, the, the students you like to make sure that they get the application. Perhaps you even give them a gift card, right, to waive the fee application. Like there's all these different strategies you could do around making sure that the campus visit, which is your most important leading indicator, is a great result. Mm -hmm. that's when you crush it. That's when you figure out that key leading indicator, your entire business can improve. And so what I want to leave everyone left away with is what is your campus visit? What is the one thing in your organization that you need to be tracking and understand that's going to really turn the tide? And in this case, improve your sales for your business. And when people find this, Alex, it's like this, euphoric moment, you know, they're super excited about it. And then they rally around it and then they measure it. I, I was working with a client in Boston about two years ago and we found out their campus visit equivalent and they started focusing on it and started tracking it. And sure enough, their sales increased by 50% by implementing this system. And this wasn't a small company. This was a decent sized company and they significant, significant growth. Was it everything? No, but it was a big part of why they ended up growing their business because they focused on, quote unquote, their campus visit. So this is to me is a, a profound working what I call on the business activity, learning to do strategies around it. And then one final thing, Alex, that kind of going to that what Amazon likes to talk about is focus on leading indicators. Once again, I know we talked about beforehand is when you're thinking and designing these new things, have an, an empty seat at the table and have the customer envisioning sitting there. What would the customer think as a result of these strategies that you're doing? It gives a great perspective that typically we don't do when we do things. We always think about it from our perspective. Oh, they want this. They... It's our view. But when we truly have empathy, if you may, for what they might be thinking, I think often we would change what we'd actually do and get something that's going to work much more effectively. Absolutely. Absolutely love that. And you gave us two... Uh... Uh, two brilliant concepts. I was going to ask you about the Amazon focus. So, uh, so I appreciate you sharing that. Um, Carl, you shared, you've been on the podcast once already, shared a ton of value. I've been even making notes. Anyone watching on the, uh, uh, on the YouTube channel will see my right hand drifting off um, to write some notes and, uh, and tapping uh, some things into my, uh, into my laptop here. So I really appreciate that. I know you've, uh, for our 
we are predominantly uh, US um, uh, listener base, but I know you've got a special offer, which is very kind of you to do so uh, for for our guests. For those that are watching again on YouTube, you will see uh, even I have the book um, on the, on proud display uh, behind me. I have uh, read it and highly recommend it. And for those looking at Carl, Carl has about a thousand copies of the books by the looks of things uh, in his background um, to uh, to discuss. So I'll let you uh, introduce your very, very kind offer for us, Carl. Yeah, Alex, for anybody who's listening to this show, um, if you send me directly an email at Carl J. Cox, C-A-R-L-J-C-O-X at 40strategy.com, that's 40strategy.com, I'll send you a free signed copy of my book. Just say that, A, you heard me on the podcast, uh, on the Private Equity Podcast with Alex, and I'll send you a free book. This, once again, only applies to our U.S.-based customers. Those who are uh, international, apologize. We, we can't afford everything from a postage shipping perspective. However, you can still get our book available on audible.com, barnesandnoble.com, and then there's an ebook version for a good price as well. So um, I encourage you to go out that. But once again, for all U.S.-based uh, people interested, I'd be more than happy to provide you a uh, one per company, if you may, a free signed copy of our book. And those thinking about it, it's uh, for those that aren't watching on YouTube and are listening on the podcast, uh, the book is called Lost at CEO, uh, obviously author Carl J. Cox, um, for those looking for it. So, well, my, my usual question is, how would we get in touch with you? Carl, you'll just share that. Anybody who wants to reach out and have a conversation with Carl, um, you know, I'm sure this has come across in this podcast. It's come on every conversation I've had with you, how passionate you are for uh, for what you do. So thank you very much for coming across this is the reason why we put the playbook series together, guys, is gives you that actionable uh, process of being able to look at your business and work on your company. It's something the non-executive director uh, that I have within the business and the people that support me with growing raw selection constantly say to me is that transition from being in your business and doing the things to being on your business and growing and developing and creating that value creation in private equity. So, Carl, this has been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you very much for coming on for a, for a second time. Absolutely, Alex. It's been a pleasure to be on your podcast today. You do a great job with questions. And I love it. What you're trying to do is really help out all of us, right, to help create more value. And it's super exciting we're able to do that. Appreciate that. And as always, thank you very much for everybody tuning in today, whether you're watching on YouTube uh, whether you're listening on whatever device you use for your podcasts, thank you very much for tuning in and uh, checking out the Private Equity Podcast today. If you haven't already, please do subscribe and you'll be notified the next podcast, which comes out now every single week. But till the next time, keep smashing it. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>